Hey everybody, thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome to Flying Blind, where we're gonna talk about uh, aviation policy. We're gonna share some lessons learned from uh, uh, from our experience in the Air Force and in uh, in civil aviation, everything from Capitol Hill to actually um, hacking uh, hacking some fighter jets today. So, thank you. My name is Michael Wagand, and I'm joined today by Hey, I'm Stuart Wagner. Uh, just here. just a little bit of background on ourselves. Um, I am a, a reformed Army officer and recovering entrepreneur. Um, I, uh, I I served in the Army as one of the first cyber officers, and then I s decided I wanted to start a company so that we could bring hardware and software solutions to uh, to the market to help protect aircraft because they don't have antivirus and stuff on it. Um, it seemed like a good idea at the time, and uh, and we grew it pretty tremendously. But um, along the way, I realized that there was a lot of policy and law that needed to change to make the market possible. And so, really excited to share with you what I've what I've learned, Stuart. Sure. Um, so I'm Stuart. I was a software developer at Microsoft, focused on data engineering, like telemetry systems. Uh, so data off of uh, operating systems, when, uh, data off of cloud services, then came over to the DOD, uh, and eventually ending up in the Air Force as the Chief Digital Transformation Officer, uh, where uh, we basically tried to learn and adapt from data off of weapon systems. So uh, Mike asked me to kind of share some of the things we've learned and, and how that might apply to cybersecurity. So really excited to give this talk and, and hopefully jump into some questions. All right, so today we're just gonna uh, give a really quick overview of uh, at least my personal thoughts on the state of affairs of uh, cybersecurity and in civil aviation, and we'll touch a little bit on where we are, like securing weapon systems, which is important for their deterrence mission. Uh, talk about some of the recent developments in, uh, in regulations. We just got a, uh, the FAA Reauthorization Act, which is passed every four years. That just got signed into law, so we'll touch on some of the um, exciting developments in that law that hopefully is going to help advance safety and security interests. Uh, Stuart's going to share some lessons from the Air Force where he actually led a series of hackathons um, against fighter jets. And then we're going to talk about uh, how data and instrumentation from those defense experiments, uh, like what lessons there may exist for, whoop, uh, for civil uh, aviation then we'll, we'll uh, have an open discussion about policy next steps. And uh, I'm going to try and convince you that everybody in this, in this room can actually have a voice in, uh, in that conversation. Um, so without further ado, um, really kind of excited to share that uh, this year, every four years, the FAA gets reauthorized. So we don't have air traffic controllers without actually Congress passing a law to pay these people um, to help us make sure that we can all fly home safely. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, it's also a chance for us to kind of update the way that uh, the entire aviation industry does business. And there's all kinds of uh, important and sometimes special interest components that get into that legislation. There's a subsection in it um, in section 360 something that talks about cybersecurity. And uh, the crazy thing about where we are today is that most aircraft continue to be increasingly interconnected, increasingly fly-by-wire, computer and software dependent, but there is no flying commercial aircraft today with a running antivirus intrusion detection or intrusion prevention system. In fact, um, do we have any pilots in the room just by show of hands? We have, we have a handful. I'm a pilot too. I'm a, a private pilot. There's no such thing as a crew indication, any type of warning, caution, or advisory light to the crew to let them know that like, Hey, something really fishy is going on, and maybe maybe don't take off. Uh, maybe you have like, um, you know, an indication of malicious messages on the data bus, or your firmware or software um, is like bad. And unfortunately, we use an industry really uh, solid, flight-worthy technology, which means it's often really old. And uh, because of that, conveniences that that we all take for granted, or security technologies that we take for granted, with like our mobile devices, where all of the software delivery is cryptographically signed, and it's, there's you know, some pretty good supply chain um, and delivery uh, you know, processes. Uh, a lot of that doesn't exist. And the first rule of, you know, one of the uh, principal rules of cybersecurity, obviously, is if you have physical access to an aircraft, uh, you can compromise, or to a computer, you can compromise it. Well, a lot of our commercial jets, uh, they fly all over, the, all over the planet, and there's a variety of people that um, have physical access even to the avionics. So all of these things kind of taken for granted, um, I like make me a little bit uncomfortable. 
Um, and fortunately, we don't have a really good example of a plane being hacked out of the sky, thank God. But the idea, obviously, is to stay ahead of that. We don't want to uh, react to safety events. And unfortunately, I will make an aggressive statement and say that many significant uh, evolutions in aviation and safety policy have been driven by fatalities. And so, um, you know, part of our mission in life, if you will, has been to uh, try and try and flip that paradigm. And I, I really appreciate everybody being here today because I know that that resonates with folks at DEF CON. Um, so in the FAA Reauthorization Act this year, I got most excited about the fact that uh, Congress directed the administrator and therefore the FAA to change the type certification process and make sure that cybersecurity and continuous monitoring of avionics is now a requirement for any new aircraft design that gets approved. Um, previously, it was like a suggestion, but this time around, it was a requirement that they must do it. Um, there are a whole bunch of other problems, though, that have to be solved. And they also um, provided a little bit through like study, we're going to help identify and make the case that uh, you need better people through a GAO report and study. Um, do you have the right people? Do you have the right funding? Do you have the right structures? Is there the right kind of committee to make sure that voices from industry, the OEMs, the airlines, uh, operators, unions, um, technologists are all heard as the rules on how all of this gets implemented um, uh, actually happen. So all of that was in the legislation this year and over the next couple of years we're going to see that implemented and uh, hopefully uh, by the end of this decade we will actually see airliners come out with real onboard continuous monitoring of their avionics, which uh, sounds like a good idea to me. Um, so just as a, as a state of affairs, the situation, if I were to put it really bluntly, is it's, it's kind of not great as it is today, <laughs> um, but it's going to get better. And, unfor and unfortunately, the legislation is coming uh, along uh, quite quickly. Actually, hats off to our European colleagues. If we have anybody that, that flew across the pond, uh, YASA has been moving exceptionally fast and actually uh, implementing regulations. And so uh, this is great that kind of the two major aviation regulators that set the set the standard for what um, for what rules look like in building and flying and maintaining aircraft and airlines um, are largely getting on the same page and moving quickly to uh, uh, to adapt all of this. So um, those are some of those recent developments and state of affairs. But I want to turn over to uh, uh, to Stuart because he has a really interesting perspective from industry and then within the Air Force that uh, I think informs the policy discussion. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, so number one, first of all, these slides that I'm going to show you now, uh, I created them while I was in the Air Force, so I need to cite myself um, and release them publicly. And so uh, I can show you these today, which is cool. Um, all right, so basically when I got to the, um, to the Air Force, uh, what we were trying to do in terms of, they call it digital transformation. I don't know if it means anything, but basically what we were trying to do, I took it to mean learning from data off of operational systems, like telemetry data. Um, and this is, this is kind of what I used to try to make the case to like generals and senior leaders, uh, senior civilians in the DOD to learn and adapt from data off of operational systems. And in the Air Force, this is like bits off jets, you know, bits off munitions, bits off um, any type of operational system, uh, but a lot of bits off of jets. Um, but, but in the DOD, this could be bits off of really ships, submarines, et cetera. And so we were trying to figure out how do we like encourage and demonstrate the potential of this data, which could be used for cyber stuff. A lot of times hackathons are confused for cyber. They can be cyber, but they also can do other things too, right? Uh, I come from more of a capability development side. Um, so, so what we were trying to do is basically emphasize and, and demonstrate the potential of this. Um, it starts with kind of this story here, which um, my background coming from Microsoft, we did this, I worked on health of systems, so reliability data. Uh, every time there's a crash on a Windows device, log data is produced. That log data in many cases is actually sent back to kind of home station to be analyzed to understand like the health of the system, right? And I can, we can talk about that more if people have specific questions, but but basically you can learn um, from various beta builds that are released and, 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 and you can learn basically what you want to fix and what will basically solve the biggest problem and that was what we kind of focused on. But like there's all these other cases uh, where, where big tech, uh, my argument here is uh, um, basically every big tech company in the world undergirds with autom automatically collected data. 
I mean, you can call it telemetry, you can call it whatever you want, but it's automatically collected data off of their systems. And there's all these examples. I won't go through each one. Uh, Tesla, of course, um, is, is AI automation, is what you see, SpaceX, electronic resilience, so the Starlink uh, example. A lot of people like to focus on the fact that there was a software patch pushed to, to mitigate basically jamming. Um, but the, the thing that's kind of underrepresented is like, how did they know what to fix? How did they know what was being jammed and how to fix it, right? Uh, and the automatic collection of data is critical for that, um, and et cetera, et cetera. I'll, I'll, I'll key in on Google as well. A lot of people think of the search engine and PageRank and now their AI algorithms, which automatically collect data. But what I actually am really fascinated by is their unplanned, basically crowdsourced learning uh, with flu data. So Google, Google Trends actually, uh, if you're familiar, was able to actually outpredict the CDC for the spread of flu, basically by the use of search terms. So there's all this like richness in data when automatically collected that's really valuable, and we were trying to emphasize that. Um, to, to, to the DOD and to the Air Force. Um, there's basically like four ways we think about learning from data um, that's collected off of operational systems. And that, I'll just point to that green box that's most relevant to this talk, which is basically you can adapt the system itself. So adapt like the operational system. You can also adapt the, the tactics, techniques, and procedures. So how you use the system. You can adapt kind of strategy, which probably is less critical, it could be useful with the FAA, I would think. And then actually you can adapt the way you actually exercise and train with data, All right? Okay, and like, um, so the, the, how did we go about basically learning and adapting from data in the Air Force? And so I'll give you kind of a, 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 a hypothetical example that I've illustrated here and then I'm gonna kind of generalize it to the DOD and it may also generalize now to the FAA um, and commercial flight. So the basic idea is like, you know, in, in the examples I gave with big tech, you basically have data, you collect, you do something with it, and then you ultimately find a way to like put it into uh, a production-like environment or a test environment and, and, and trial effects with it of some kind, and then ultimately collect on that to improve it. And that's your kind of typical iteration pipeline. They call that like DevOps, right? Um, in the Air Force, it's a little bit harder um, because we have to deal with things like classification. We may have like degraded comms. It's not as simple as just sending bits over an internet connection. Um, and so it starts with, and this is an example again, I would use this to pitch to senior leaders. The idea is basically a mission captures some information. So we fly, you know, some sort of jet that may or may not collect on, on a neutral or adversarial or friendly uh, system of some kind. And you produce bits during that process. That sensor data needs to get like shared to some human or machine that can do something with it. So you gotta get it off the operational system, right? And then you need to, this is like a critical difference in the DOD is like you need to classify the data. So you need to know like what is the classification of the data? It could be secret, it could be top secret, it could be unclassified, it could be lots of things. There's a lot we can go into on that too, when you, especially when you combine data, sometimes it up classes. Uh, which is complicated. So um, if you want to learn, sometimes you have to learn at higher classifications. Um, and, then, and then basically you need to get that to like doers or machines that can learn from that data. So that could be analytics, that fourth box with too many words in it, is, is doers doing stuff with data. And it could be machines or humans trying to build stuff um, in a permissive environment where you can basically do stuff, right? And then you want to field those, those solutions um, in some way or employ them in some way that produce new data uh, that allows you to restart this process, right? And so what we kind of call this in the DOD is like we call this bits to effect. They're focused on effects, but you could think of those as just being changes to a system. And so the idea, and this is how it generalizes. So basically, fundamentally, those steps um, generalize in this format. Number one, you need to instrument and collect data. If you have no instrumentation off the system, you do not produce a change or effect based on data because the data never existed in the first place. There were no bits to collect. Um, once you have collection of those bits on the system, you need to get them off the system if you're going to try to generalize learning across the system and not just to that specific device, right? And so piping and data engineering, um, that's, important, I think, in operational systems that are disconnected, such as like aircraft. Um, the next is probably less relevant, but potentially relevant is like data classification and access. So certain data is going to be like restricted or protected. You need to figure out like what is, what is that restricted portion and, 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 um, and, and, and what to do with it. Um, I'll give one example. Um, that I think about, and it may be relevant um, also in, in, in general aviation as well, which is basically 
um, even if the device you're collecting from is not of some sophisticated, uh, protected, or classified origin, if it has the ability to collect things near it that are highly classified or protected, then the data that's collected then is classi uh, classified at that level. So we might fly something like, say, an F-16 next to something maybe more classified, like, say, I don't know, an F-22 or something, right? That would be, that data would become much more classified because it collected near something of high, high importance. And so, yeah, I could imagine some examples in civil aviation where that could take place. Uh, the next is the ability to do stuff with the data. So you need to be able to bring that data into an environment where you can try and do stuff. And so what we did is we actually, like, um, produced these really permissive environments that isolated the protected data and allowed people to do stuff with it, then you employ the effects, and that's how it kind of generalizes. Okay, um, back to you. So anytime I hear uh, classification, I see a lot of my um, civil colleagues roll their eyes. I just think we have the exact same thing. We just call it proprietary data and different different versions of that. There's actually a lot of uh, generalizations between those, those two problem sets. Um, I want to just throw out a couple uh, uh, thoughts and perspectives. Number one, I hear a lot of companies in aerospace say, hey, we're already collecting like more data off of systems than we know what to do with. And uh, I think that that's actually a fallacy. I think that we can do a significantly better job actually instrumenting, especially fly-by-wire assets, and, and must do that for safety, reliability, is really good business or economic efficiency reasons to do that. But um, the order of magnitude, uh, you know, uh, data problem that uh, a lot of people complain about, like, what would we do with all of this? It's expensive to collect and record all of that. I think that um, I think that folks in aerospace that that say that don't really appreciate how other industries have solved that problem and how important and useful that data is. That data also, I, I am worried about how um, collected aviation, aggregated or uh, desensitized data uh, makes its way into the policy process because I actually don't see a lot of examples of that. I think that there are tremendous data silos in industry. You have operators that have, uh, you know, data insights, OEMs that have data insights. Those two often do not share appropriately and then almost the last people to kind of get high level insights, uh, knowledge out of that are, uh, are regulatory bodies. Um, and so breaking down those silos, I think, uh, actually has a tremendous impact on safety and, and the security conversation. Um, so the the whole data, what the Air Force calls an OODA loop, it's a learning cycle. Um, in civil aviation, there's a uh, there's a, a real significant policy problem, which is that we've learned over time to build safe systems. Um, we have really strict software development, testing, and approval processes to make sure that an aircraft and the software on it is safe to fly. And we want to reduce that risk as much as possible. But that means that it takes a lot of time and a lot of money in order to make changes to important software systems. There's a talk at 12 that's going to dive into all the uh, all the nuance there, different design assurance levels. Like you obviously are going to put more attention to things that are what they call DAL A. Uh, the most important computers on board a plane as opposed to the things that don't matter or not safety critical. Um, but this is directly at odds with a patching process, which fundamentally does not exist. So from a policy perspective, um, really nobody has figured out yet if you identify a zero day on an avionics computer that is really important for the function of that aircraft, how do you quickly uh, spin a fix and then propagate that without either grounding the fleet in the interim or just ignoring that problem, working on it in the background, letting everybody, you know, probably not even know that there's a potential risk and then rolling out a software update once it goes through the normal software development process. Oh, you know, and there's there's different DIA, 178, um, you know, 360, et cetera. So, um, so that is, uh, that's, that's really interesting that we have both safety and a lack of security processes, but adapting existing IT security processes such as patching will come into direct conflict with the way that we build, certify, test, and deliver software today. Um, the uh, instrumentation and data kind of loop and the time horizons there all intersect. And uh, back to the legislation, uh, there's now a, a, you know, a committee with, um, uh, that's going to be stood up to try and grapple with these issues. And, the way that we can all get involved is that uh, there's a request for you know comment 
um, you know, process that many of us are familiar with. Uh, a lot of people underutilize that, or when they do comment, and candidly, they're, uh, you know, a lot of the comments are um, in not offering like solutions or not really technically rich. Like if you have thoughts and opinions on how these processes or how specific, uh, you know, technology should be um, should be implemented, it is fascinating to me to have seen examples of how individual comments get bubbled up and actually like discussed in in the committees that actually set the rules and the regulations for how um, how this law is implemented and how safety technologies actually get rolled out. So I would encourage everybody to actually check that out if, if, uh, if, the, if you see a component of this problem that's interesting and you want to get that, that voice out there. There's both, a, there's both kind of a government-sponsored and an industry-sponsored side to this world. And so um, uh, for those that are unaware, there's uh, a set of committees run by an organization called RTCA that essentially builds all of this. It's usually usually has representation from government, but mostly um, industry focused. And these two things intersect at higher policy levels, but um, it's really important to kind of interface with both. So um, we uh, just looking at the clock, actually wanted to reserve uh, a bunch of time with all of this background for questions. Um, I know that we have a lot of experience in the audience, so I think we will. Uh, we're just going to ask Stuart if you want to talk about hackathons. And I want to preface the Air Force, uh, your, your, your component here that I'm really excited to have seen the Aviation Village at DEF CON. Um, are we out of, are we looking? Oh, get out. Are you serious? All right. Well, we won't hold you that long. We'll give you, we'll give you some time. But, um, uh, really exciting to see how the Aviation Village has evolved over the last couple of years and that major manufacturers are showing up and participating. Um, however, uh, there's, there, there's still, as I think, a lot of work to be done um, in terms of looking at pen testing, building processes, and providing protections for security researchers to do more work, especially on uh, core avionic elements where you can't buy this stuff on eBay. So there's first like an access problem. How do you get access to the tech? Second, um, a lot of the work that's been done uh, in the IT industry uh, when it comes to uh, you know bug bounties and reporting processes and protections for security researchers needs to kind of be ported over to aviation. And the Air Force has done some really cool stuff here with the, the Bravo uh, program. So uh, Stuart, can you talk a little bit about how you stood that up and, and how it resulted and, and what civil aviation can learn? Yeah, sure. So. Um it's kind of, it's it's not so different from, and it's an honor to be here at DEF CON. I've, I've been an admirer, but this is my first time here. Um, but basically what we did is is we started with this premise as described of what can we do with kind of recorded operational data. Uh, and similar to the Aviation Village here, we basically started running events where like engineers from within DOD, so these are civilian and military personnel, as well as, as um, and, and actually there was a talk given earlier, uh, the, the DOD lawyer versus uh, open source software developer, Rebecca Lively ran that, uh, I think on Friday, and, and, and really enjoyed that talk. So, and I think that it was inspired in part by one of these events. But basically we ran about 10 of these events, ranging in size from around 50, 75 people to actually 700, uh, which is pretty large. These were classified and, and um, protected events, uh, but actually any American citizen for a number of these events uh, was able to uh, participate. So like anybody here who's an American citizen could have applied and participated. Um, we ended up producing about 200 um, software prototypes from real operational data, which is very unusual at DOD. Oftentimes the prototypes are produced without the data. Um, what did we, what did we kind of learn from this? I'd say a couple things. So number one, we found that like within the Department of Defense, there's actually like a massive set of talent. Just like when you're, when your number N is so large, um, DOD, I think, had, I mean, I know Air Force has around 2 million employees. I don't know the size of DOD, but it's probably around 3x that. When your N is sufficiently large, you just have tinkerers, engineers, people who just want to go play with, um, 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 different systems and so we were able to kind of create that opportunity across these 10 events and do so as well as international uh, we ran one in Europe uh, in Germany we ran one in the Indo-PACOM region in Hawaii uh, we ran one uh, in coordination with CENTCOM uh, which they publicly disclosed was on um, counter unmanned aerial systems and so 
we were able to do some pretty cool and interesting things and like inspire a lot of people just like DEF CON does every year. And so I think we took some inspiration from DEF CON and, and, um, and, and we're able to kind of produce projects, some of which uh, were able to enter kind of production within DOD and actually make some impact, some of which I can't even talk about here. But um, yeah, and then, and then the, the last slide I'll cover real quick. Um, so those were all kind of like events that we organized but there's so much more happening in terms of 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 kind of um, these 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 events where where people gather together to kind of learn and adapt from data off of systems or do engage in cyber testing and penetration testing, um, and so these are some of those those things that have that have come out of this. And it's important to note that like this is occurring definitely in the United States and with other democratic you know allies and things like that. Uh, there was there was a national security hackathon in El Segundo. There was one in in, in Stanford. Um, there's been there's been venture capital involved. There's been kind of just citizens wanting to do this as well. Um, in Ukraine, you have the anti shahid um, hackathon that took place, focused on basically defending their interests. Uh, and then you've also got you know, of course, this is taking place uh, in 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 some kind of some would say adversarial countries, so democratic republics such as you know in 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 Russia and China, where they're also using these activities. So. This is this is occurring kind of everywhere, and 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 we're seeing various ways in which it's being employed, and and I can talk more about that in the questions. But Mike, back to you. Yeah. So uh, crazy crazy policy ideas. One, um, it would be really cool to see the FAA actually run and sponsor some hackathons, and also for industry uh, to open their doors and make some of the uh, most kind of exclusive uh, avionics components that are on. Uh, many of the planes that you know provide the most seat carrying capacity, uh, so therefore, like the highest impact systems, um, it'd be really cool to see, uh, you know, more of that made available for uh, the community uh, to mess with. Um, we have to figure out a patching process second, and we have to figure out how we're going to balance speed with safety and uh, and software review. Uh, that's a really tough nut to crack, but. Uh, I think that there are really important lessons uh, to learn. We don't want to uh, move so fast that you have, you know, the the ability for somebody to uh, make a mistake like like CrowdStrike did the other day. But at the same time, we have to, uh, you know, quickly uh, address emerging threats and in new discoveries and do so on like uh, a smaller time horizon than the 12 or 18 months that it typically takes to rush through. Um, a DAL A, uh, you know, software change to a major component and actually get that proliferated. Um, we also have to figure out, uh, you know, somehow what the what the policy and economic frameworks are that support that um, to make a more inclusive kind of environment to to make all that possible. So um, we would love to uh, get some feedback from the audience and uh, answer any questions or engage in discussion. So with that, uh, we'll we'll just pause there and. Uh, and see, I, I, I will start by posing a question to you guys. Which of these crazy ideas that we've thrown out or any of the insights here uh, has really resonated or, or you think is a terrible idea? Sir. Great question. The first thing that comes to mind is, um, as a technologist, telemetry and real-time monitoring sounds like a phenomenal idea. And I want to acknowledge, as a pilot, the first concern that comes to mind, which is like, wait, are they going to instrument and know every single time that I don't make an absolutely perfect touchdown? And then is my job going to be potentially at risk if I'm on the back half of that curve? So that's like the first thing that I want to share that actually came to mind. Um, to, to your point, sorry, could you just restate very concisely the, the final uh, question that you asked? Mm-hmm. 
why was it necessary to that? So given that framing, what do you see from that that notion of real time and non Evolving too, yeah. Okay, so um so my thoughts on this from a, uh, a crew, crew alerting perspective, um, just uh, really, really quick f to uh, bring us all up to speed. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that like uh, one of the fundamental and most important things that, that a crew does obviously is decision making and you want to preserve the, um, the pilot's ability to, uh, to make decisions. Um, there is a balance in terms of the amount of information that you give a pilot because uh, all pilots uh, are trained to manage basically their attention, their workload. They call this crew load. And when you overload cognitively uh, the crew, the same thing happens, um, you know, like in a sock, when you just throw so many alerts, uh, you can kind of paralyze and affect the ability for them to accomplish their job. So uh, there's a bunch of disciplines that come into, uh, into this question and figuring out, you know, what do you share with the crew? for what purpose, when, where, and why, and how you do so. Um, there are human factors. There's like design, UI, UX elements to that. There's process, there's training implications. Um, and it's, a, it's actually a really, really difficult, uh, uh, I think, question to answer. So I don't know that anybody has that figured out. First thing I wanna say is like, I'm not gonna have an answer to that, but I feel really strongly as a pilot that I would like to know before I go wheels up, um, on the runway that I have uh, a safe configuration of hardware and software on the plane, um, first and foremost, because uh, the situation is different when you are weight on wheels, you're on the ground as opposed to in flight. If I lose a system, I need to understand uh, very quickly uh, what other systems I can rely on to fly, navigate, or communicate the plane. Um, pilots get indications, warnings, cautions, and advisories to do that in the event of systems losses. But we don't train or inform pilots to think today about the implications of either malicious software or software glitches or failures. I think the closest thing that, that comes to that uh, relatably is like uh, somebody didn't update logs on a plane and now I have like out of date charts or an out of date navigation database or something like that and I can't do a specific type of procedure. Um, I think that there is a component of training where we want pilots to understand that systems, you know, can be impacted in certain ways and it informs the way that they think about using redundant uh, systems or more analog capabilities to perform functions. And I think some type of indication in the cockpit uh, is important while we continue to advance the state of art of actually securing the technology itself. Um, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer for you, but I see a, I see a head shaking. Um, yeah. Um, well, I don't think that we did. Please, please, and and also is is real time a requirement or is it just getting all of the data and being able to protect a system at scale maybe with some delays in that data collection the requirement uh, what what are the drawbacks yeah in my experience basically the the use of data basically is most effective when you need to make calibrations or changes to a system so if everything's working great um, I mean, like, it may be able to improve workflows, it may be able to improve the preciseness or accuracy of your work, but fundamentally, um, if things are going great and you have no problem, then, then the data is not really important. The data becomes most useful in under courses of, of basically need for calibration or change um, in the way, in current operating flows. So, like, for example, I could imagine if, if maybe, may, maybe there's a massive storm that re requires basically a bunch of planes to land unexpectedly in different places, potentially the collection of data could, could inform or improve on decision making there so that that kind of translates to in the DOD world we call that command and control right so if some sort of centralized control or decentralized control the collection of data under that circumstance would be useful um, on the plane itself I can think of a example which I'm going to be intentionally a little bit vague about but basically um, if you were to lose say um, a sensor system that has multiple sensors and you were to lose say one of them um, you could potentially rely on those others, which may not, like to basically infer, like to inference or, or, or um, predict what that missing sensor would see. 
And so that under certain circumstances, that could be useful. So there's ways to basically produce some sort of emergent capability um, or, or extract some signal from other systems that are lost that are generally not relied on under, under general normal operating conditions. And so those are some ways in which we've found the use of data off an operational system to be really valuable um, under mission, like DOD mission. Uh, it may translate to civil aviation. Does that sort of answer your question? Give you some examples? Okay. I'll just add, um, I, I think that uh, I think that streaming real-time data um, is is great, but there's there's a need to get all of the data, and it doesn't necessarily happen um, when the plane is flying. And when I say all of the data, I'm thinking like full take data collection off um, off the onboard avionics networks, right? So a rank. 664, mil standard 1553, those, the inner LRU communications. Because uh, if you were to think a little bit differently about the aircraft, that data allows you to treat each aircraft as a sensing system. And any you know data scientist will tell you that the more data that they have, obviously the better that they can train predictive you know maintenance models, the better that you can train and identify potential predictive indicators of uh, of threats, especially um, as certain adversaries, in some cases, have demonstrated over and over again the ability to um, actually test emergent capabilities. Like you want to be able to identify that before an entire fleet is potentially impacted. So um, you know maybe this data is all collected, it's cached, and then it is uh, you know it's recovered like on the ground, where it's less expensive to do so with some you know near wireless means as opposed to you know clogging up like an expensive SATCOM link. But um, you can imagine how useful that would be potentially for a security use case. I think the, the compelling economic reason to do that will, will certainly be like maintenance and continuous evaluation of like updates or feature identification initially. But, uh, but certainly there's a safety and, and a security element to that that I don't think is fully appreciated yet. Sir. the impact where have I lost, you know? And then uh, do I have redundancy? Do I have backups? Do I have things that I can deal with? You know, so consequent, maybe I have to continue to be a bomb or something like that, you know? But then the main third part, I mean, this kind of gets to the real-time data stream. Is this problem going to get worse? Is this something, you know, are there mitigations in place that are going to stop this problem from getting worse? I mean, kind of a crude example is if I see my level pressure indicator drop, is that because my sensor failed? Or Spinning thing is going to stop going around and spinning thing. So that's a situation where an indicator is going to all of a sudden become a much worse situation. For me. So to me, I think that's probably, and we're a long ways from that. We're going to have to gather a lot of this data to learn that we can now begin to identify this problem is not going to go This problem is going to impact more flight systems. And now the urgency of my decision making is going to be a fundamentally different thing. I, I think this is really exciting. Thing that I'm just concerned about is that we can't even do that on terrestrial systems well. But we can't even do that on enterprise systems. I don't know how we're going to do it on aircraft without folding our mental image of how we handle it. And maybe a fourth thing to consider too, and, and this one's totally up for debate, so contentious concept here, but what about intent? Um, w would it be, would it impact? decision making in the cockpit, if you knew that systems were intentionally being affected or if it was an unintended thing, right? So if something was maintenance or if it was malicious. So, you know, today, uh, in the last year and a half, if you've been reading the news, there are thousands of flights every month that are impacted with GPS spoofing and jamming. And some uh, MMR, GPS receivers, when they get bad time from like a delayed GPS signal, that's spoofing, it causes internal systems to fail and crash. This can, um, this if you know that that is happening intentionally, as opposed to, um, as opposed to just a maintenance anomaly, it can impact your decision making on if you proceed, divert, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, 
that's uh, an insight that I heard from, uh, from some pilots recently that were sharing an example where coming back from the Middle East where they, they knew to expect um, uh, some GPS interference, lost some systems, but uh, they were expecting that. What they weren't expecting was that they would have to fly at a lower flight level over the Atlantic, and that impacted their fuel burn because when you fly at higher altitudes, you get uh, different fuel burn efficiencies. Well, they had they had not uh, they had not expected that, and so when they reran all of their range calculations, um, they were within safety limits to make it to their final destination, but had to constantly weigh and consider a divert. Um, knowing that that was coming and knowing that that was a malicious activity was really uh, impactful because they were expecting it and they were able to monitor and uh, and make changes. When the unexpected happens, sometimes it's useful and informs your decision making if this is um, if this is malicious. And so that's another element to you know like the the crew alert conversation. That's extremely nuanced, and I don't think we have any questions uh, answered around around that. But uh, yeah, really really tough stuff uh, as it relates to policy. Um, you know, I think getting the right uh, frameworks, the right committees, and the right people in the room to uh, wrestle and grapple with these concepts. Um, and see what we can learn from like diverse experiences is, is the probably the best way to arrive at the best answer. And that best answer is almost certainly going to evolve over time as threats evolve, as the technology evolves. Um, in the meantime, a lot of people are just going to be deeply unsatisfied with the status quo. So, uh, fantastic. Sir. Versus your fear that you, know, you have these events, this can it have military aircraft, and light and then ocean areas. If it's not done in a controlled manner, you know, with proprietary data, non disclosure, that would most likely be being involved in different things. And the air dirty monitoring, yeah, you're going to find things, but then people involved will know about it. So now you have a lot of other people to know easily when you start disclosing. Because right now, the biggest problem right now. I think disclosure may be something like like uh, controlling disclosure processes. Um, you know, is is a potential way to mitigate some of that. But uh, I, I see some audience reactions. Does anybody in the audience have uh, thoughts and opinions, sir? Okay, so, I like the idea. I actually like the idea of the FAA. Um, college professor. There's a lot of colleges out there that have engineering programs that don't really deal with avionics. My, my school does. And I could see there being a lot of students who would be engaged in this. The thing that I, I, can, I, can, I can understand where he's coming from, but we've proven over and over throughout time that uh, security code security fails. And it fails in the worst ways because when you only rely on security by obscurity, you don't inform the defenders either. And so at least if we can find these bugs, we don't have to worry that an adversary has found it and just hasn't told anyone because they're waiting for that day that they're going to, you know, speaking of 9 11, they've got all these people out there ready to insert a thumb drive at all of these maintenance bases across the country. They don't even know why they're doing it. And then that day comes and we're so just summarizing, right, security obscurity, the counterpoint to, um, you know, research, how do you control it from getting out, especially important, just to highlight, I think you missed the, like, it, it's really expensive and takes a long time to fix these systems. And so uh, to your point, yeah, so these are, these are the two battling components. I, I saw an opinion in the back, sir, did you have something to add to that? One thing I'll share is, um, I don't know if this is working or not, it's fine. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, one, thing, one thing I noticed, at least um, 
in the Air Force, which consists of Air Force and Space Force, is that basically telemetry collection was natural off of space systems. And the connection I made to that was because they're designed, at least Space Force doesn't really, as of now, send astronauts up. Um, and, so, and so those are autonomous systems. And so that's probably a, a, like a very good test bed for, for it's naturally collecting and in, it's naturally instrumented um, because it has to be. Um, and it naturally also solves for that piping problem because if you, uh, generally, not always, um, because if you don't have the pipes, then it's going to just need to be autonomous without the pipes, right? So, so yes, we did see that. Um, one thing I, I thought of later, I want to try to answer your question a little bit better that I thought was relevant. I think it's come up a bit, but may not have been em emphasized is the predictive maintenance piece of this data for humans. So, um, in, in, in contrast to autonomous systems, like while you have human lives at stake, what we have seen, at least in the Air Force, is that the automatic collection of this data, even if harvested and leveraged later, we may be able to gain insights and start to see signal that certain functions of a mission system are not operating at spec. Or maybe they are operating at spec, what we thought was spec 30 years ago, um, but, but maybe that spec needs to be changed. So like the collection of that data allows us to make these systems safer. Contrasting that against the concerns of like, you know, vulnerability or exploitation is tough to understand. It's about, I mean, like the typical kind of cost calculation is risk times um, the, the, the um, impact of, 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 you know, that, that risk coming true, right? So I don't know what the, I don't know which one, uh, which one to weigh between the two, but I do know that um, in terms of safety of systems, the collection of data can allow you to make those systems safer. It also could save money because if we don't have things breaking in the air, to your point of losing oil pressure, if we, if we are able to mitigate them on the ground before you fly, uh, well, it saves people and it also could save money. Those are some kind of thoughts that have emerged from this discussion. I have, a, I have an observation and that is that in the emergent eVTOL uh, market, Every single one of those designs that I've interacted with their design teams, they are uh, they are planning as a basic requirement, as a basic feature of the system, uh, full take avionic data collection and significant telemetry instrumentation, like significantly more advanced than anything that we see in in manned, both at the airline, you know, GA level, et cetera. Um, they're not just doing that for tests and evaluation. Um, in in DOD and in civil aviation, historically, how we built systems is uh, when you have, you know, a, a prototype a test aircraft, we put all these orange wire and orange boxes, data collectors, and we set everything up. Um, but then we rip all of that out for size weight, you know, uh, for swap savings when things go into production. And I think that um, that those industries have certainly learned, hey, there's all of these unknown unknowns, and we just want all of the data because we're convinced that it will satisfy all of these needs in the future. The big question, I think, for operators right now, uh, like airlines is, is it worth retrofitting legacy fleets with um, some type of capability to do that? Is there you know, uh, sufficient like safety and economic use case to, um, to underwrite that investment? And that's some of the debate that I hear right now. In the back, yes, sir. So I think answering the uh, question to GPS interference um, is extremely uh, system nuanced, obviously. Uh, 
there's been an interesting trend in aviation over the last uh, 20 years where um, if you're if any systems engineers um, don't hold me to the strict definitions of this, but you've seen increasing coupling of inertial navigation to, um, to discipline that with uh, external GNSS signaling. And when these systems are completely independent, that's fantastic. You lose one, you can, you can roll over to the other. Um, when they are highly coupled, uh, obviously a problem with one flows into the other. And so it, it degrades the independence and the, and the backup utility. We have seen that in a number of specific designs. I won't call out anybody, but a lot of, a lot of really smart people right now are trying to implement fixes and, and, um, and separate these systems a little bit more because that seems like the natural thing. There were really good reasons, but, uh, I think, you know, we, we, like the industry learned that, um, boy, timing, uh, is really important and there's tremendous time sensitivity and synchronization on internal systems and that wasn't like properly fuzzed or tested for interference because nobody really assumed that GPS spoofing would be, uh, you know, such, such commonplace or directed against civil assets. And now we know that that's probably naive. Um, so uh, th those are just some initial, I think, thoughts that come to mind or at least perceptions from, from my uh, point of view. There's really good reporting out on how uh, uh, how pervasive GPS spoofing is. I would say spoofing is far more impactful on aviation systems in my learned experience the last two years than jamming. Jamming's kind of fine, like systems are actually really resilient to um, not getting lock and not being able to provide that. They're designed with all kinds of redundancies and backups. It's, it's that uh, false data injection, if you think of spoofing, like within the skin of the, the plane that maybe wasn't appropriately tested. Um, the, the issue is that on certain fleets that are flying today, you have uh, a subset of those where you can't just drop a software or firmware fix on certain LRUs um, to evolve this. And so people are trying to figure out like how do they mitigate those risks now. Um, but yeah, there's some really good reporting on this already that's out, out in the news. I think we have time for one last question, sir. Yeah, I am a huge fan and fan like fanatical advocate for we need to educate pilots to their software dependencies so that they really pay attention and understand that uh, reverting back to um, secondary and tertiary navigation and uh, flying processes that they're already taught, like keep those skills sharp, expect systems potentially to be lost and, and you know, put a little bit of thought to like the fact that, yeah, there is supply, there, there's cyber, there's a cyber dependency. Um, I think that the training conversation is, uh, is really going to evolve in terms of what that means. But today the practical guidance is, uh, you know, make sure that you can use your, your backup, like analog systems to navigate and fly. Um, but what that means in the future, if there's some type of cyber crew indication, what emergency procedures they go to and how that all evolves, I'm really excited to see how that happens. So um, we have time for one more question, sir. I have not. That sounds really scary. Um, <laughs> yeah, just I I haven't no. That's that is very evil. Thank you for giving me another reason to stay up at night. Um, Stuart, any last comments before we wrap it up?
Hey, everybody, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Take care.